some involving minors. Viewer discretion is advised. Previously on part two. The logistics are a nightmare. There's cases in Cook County and state court. There's four cases. There's a case in federal court here in Illinois and a case in New York. In the United States, the wheels turn based on precedent. And unfortunately for Robert, he is the guinea pig when it comes to the hashtag Me Too. And Tazaki Shange says, being black and a woman is a metaphysical thing that I haven't figured out yet. And so I'm still trying to figure it out, but it's an obstacle I overcome every day. The Me Too being that they were able to tap into something that happened to everyone and empower them to say something about it. In my lifetime, that's a good thing. But what that narrative doesn't speak to is people who are opportunistic. The criminal justice people, and a lot of other people might feel that he was guilty in 2008 and he got away with it. And because it was a, I don't guess, a black thing to them, it's more of a, we're gonna find a way to get you now. I'm a professional female, and the Me Too movement is ruining my life. I think that R. Kelly was able to get away with behavior that was pushed aside because he was famous and he was selling dreams. It was never her fault. Her music was something she should have stayed in. And when she shared her experience with him, I think that was the key that allowed him to pray on her. That was his end. The story of Angelo turned out to be a story that will rival the messiest of soap operas in the highest rated shows of the Jerry Springer or Maury Povich episode. He and his family withstood slander, all out lies, as well as the injustice of a justice system not designed for a parent's heart, but designed to be patient and wait for an opportune moment. That moment finally came with R. Kelly being in jail and the answered prayers of Azriel seeming to wake up and shake the spell she had previously been in. Angelo's quest to recover and reunite with Azriel finally came to an end. This is my baby right here. He reunited with his daughter, and they immediately began to repair a strained father and daughter relationship. Asriel, at the time, seemed to still hold on to a resentment built on everything she had just gone through. I think we still have to address the elephant in the room. We haven't really taken that time, you know, to do so. It's, it's not about what the world thought it was about. It was about me getting relationships with my daughter getting the understanding that she was good. Through all the back and forward, the talk, the media, everything, you got painted a picture. So what I needed was confirmation from my daughter. I understand that, and I respect that completely. <clears throat> but I feel like for me, where it was so hard for me and why I continue to not have communication with my family, is because this Lifetime documentary stuff just happened within the last two 
And then out of nowhere, these last two years, you hear, oh my God, this is happening. Oh my God, that is happening. I just feel like, how can you be oblivious to the years that I was okay and just snap, oh my God, I need to know where my daughter's at. She's this, she's that. I need to make sure she's okay. Mm -hmm. Like I've been okay for three years prior. That's where I drew my line because at that point I was an adult. And at that point I felt like, I was okay. So to believe something like that, so extreme, so bizarre, so outrageous, I just couldn't even fathom my parents, my parents believing something as bizarre as that. I just really couldn't. <laughs> and that's fair. But what you got to understand is we haven't talked to you after 16. That's when you graduated. Mm -hmm. That's when things went blank. It didn't go oh, blank, oh. but communication slowed down because at and, that point I was an adult. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There was never no black community. I could show you text messages over and over. But that's but to him. To him, to your phones, to everybody's phones. And I was every, guys. No, I died. I have received on an Apple. I don't, I don't have an Apple phone. Too. I will call you guys. Don't pay no picture. Like, I have not talked to you guys in over a year because I would call you guys four or five months at a time. And yes. when I would call you guys, you guys would be yelling. You guys would be cursing me out. Mommy would be yelling at the top of her lungs. I don't have And none. so what I would do, I'd say, okay, I'm going to give you about four or five months. Yes. And then hopefully you just miss me so much that you just want to talk to me and your arms are open. And eventually it got to that. Unfortunately, it took a little bit longer than I anticipated. Yes. As a parent, mm -hmm. guess what if you did? If let not me, a let me ask you this, uh -huh. before graduation, I was not even checking in every day then. Yeah, I was, was, I talked I to was you, not. I, I, you'll be like, Dad, I'm busy, I'll call you back. It was no more, you weren't talking, but you was texting. And if, uh, you, if you're free, exactly. you'll call me, hey, Dad, what you doing? As but I didn't do it every day. Now, don't pay no we pictures. Didn't, like we I didn't say every day. Now, maybe like once a week, once every two weeks or so. I didn't I'm have to know. call you every day. I talked okay, to you. Okay, so why I when I become 18, 19, 20, 21, I got to check in with y'all every day? Who, who, where do <laughs> you get that from? Your wife. This, yes. this is this, what you don't understand. What? Your wife called me. My mother saying... Oh, there's a lot of rumors going around. I need you to call me every single day. I need to hear your voice every day. I need you to check in with me every day. I said, first of all, I haven't been doing that for these first couple of years. So now that I'm an adult, I'm definitely not about to check in with you every day. And that's what started it all. Her what, pride and my pride. So what does that have to do with me? You're attached to her. That's, that's your wife. That's so, your wife. So I became the enemy, but you only defeated me. Because when I was talking to you, Okay, folks, why well, we only have 49 in the chat? Hmm. Are we going to get me some more people? Get them likes up. Get them up. Are we gonna get more people? <laughs> I know. I'm Wait, can you hear me, But guys, come on. Get it up there. Can you hear me? Oh. Call him because at that point, the only thing I get is bickering every time I pick up the phone. So if I can avoid it, if I can enjoy myself in this nice little penthouse while we in New York for the weekend, I'm going to enjoy my weekend. It was so, very suffocating because I was an adult at the end of the day, period. And like I said, I'm not obligated to answer anyone. I know that you are my father and I love you dearly. But if I was a homeless person on the street right now with a cell phone and I did not want to call you, I would have that right. Now, would it make it right? If I was a, a homeless person on the street, she has that right not to call him if she doesn't want to, right? Dom's right. She ran the parents. You you could definitely hear it. She ran. 
Gosh, she ran. And stuff. you can tell he's trying to talk to her in a calm yeah. way so that she doesn't like get angry. Yeah, I thought she didn't have a phone. That's the narrative they want to put out. I hope you guys are taking notes. Please take notes of what you're hearing. Um, I'm going to continue, okay? Exactly, Randa. Probably not. But I'm obligated to that right. Probably I don't not. Want to, but I'm but obligated to that right. I don't want That's you. That's what I'm going to gonna do. I'm going to hunt every street, every corner, every curb, every bridge until I find you. Because I, as a father, have to lay eyes on you. And that, I don't care what you say, what comes out your mouth to make us look a certain way or make you feel better or that situation, yeah. that's fine. I can accept that. But at the end of the day, nothing going to stop me from getting you right here beside me. Rather, it's in the street. I got to sleep in the street with you. It's not a problem with me. See, as long as I'm with you, and that goes for any of my kids, I will go against the world for any of my children. So that that's I a know. fact. Okay. The relationship between Azriel and Angelo was thought to be that of any man and his daughter. But the conversation was that of two people verbally fighting for dominance and proving a point to justify a guilt or innocence, defending what some would consider a taboo relationship. The actions and travels of Angelo will go on to be criticized because of his passion with regaining his daughter and he would continue on his quest to, at times, discredit and accuse R. Kelly of navigating Azriel's tendencies to be uncontrollable and confrontational. Some would agree with Angelo, but then there were others to simply see him as a modern-day pimp, pimping his own daughter. One would have to question and wonder if any of this was true, especially considering the negative connotations that accompanied the often-heard myth of black fathers are not there for their children. Right or wrong, regardless to how he handled it, or whatever way it should have seemed, Angela was there. But then again, so was R. Kelly. Let me get this straight. You want to film me cutting my cake? Mm -hmm. My father's day cake? Yeah. You want me to get up from this chair, <laughs> leave my movie, and go I want is that what y'all want yeah it's a great idea <laughs> this prior Father's Day Robert talks about his kids all the time um is talk about but I got him a cake made and <laughs> He loved the cake so much. He thought it was so beautiful. He never wanted to cut the cake. Chop Let's get some of those little plates. Some of those little plates. What's some in here too? Let's see it. Okay, can you turn down roots? Uh, Just power. Let's see what looks like. Domestic to friends. Let me just get my dick dude. 
I don't know. That's my role. Okay, so, where are we cutting this thing from? Let's cut it from the back. So. Cut it from the back. You do say that. Okay, so. You mean turn it around? Yeah. So just in case. Did you get Happy Father's Day with Tony Cotton? Okay. okay, this is a golden cake. Yeah. Which they've made me. And I'm very proud of it. Matter of fact, I'm so mm -hmm. proud of this cake that mm -hmm. it's been sitting here for three days. I've been I didn't want to cut it because <laughs> it's so beautiful. I mean, look at this cake. This cake is unbelievable, man. Like, oh my god. Like this is everything. Like, mm -hmm. seriously. Like, I totally love it. It's, good. it is so it's good. an everything cake. Okay, so anyway. Fit for a king. <laughs> All right, so he wants me to start from the back. What I'm going to do is going to take the knife. And we're going to stab it straight down the middle mm. through the brain of the cake. <laughs> and we're going to go straight down. As you can see, the knife is going down. Once it reaches bottom, which there it is, it has to reach the bottom there. I am going to start to pull this way. The knife is so sharp, this should work. Okay. And now I'm going to just continue to go down, work Aww. in the cake to get a nice slice there going. Okay, that's the first part. Now I'm going to move it around just this way. Now I think <laughs> I'm going to have a detach crown here a little bit. <laughs> and as I detach the crown, might want to think about putting it in the freezer. Where else? No, not the freezer. Uh. But where does a crown go? On your head. There we go. Uh. And that's a choice. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now oh my we're going to place the crown <laughs> on the king's head. Okay. <laughs> Hear he, hear he, the king lives. Robert the third. Yeah. Okay. So this is the Father's Day cake crown. Okay. The cake came with a crown. And yes, the cake in the crown is the same. The crown is just as uh, edible as the cake is, okay? Mm -hmm. Which means we are going to kill this crown later on <laughs> <laughs> with some milk. I'm going to take the crown off. There probably will be white rings around my head. <laughs> Call it a halo. <laughs> All right, we're going to place the crown here. Okay. We're going to continue to cut this cake. Okay. Oh, I feel so bad. First slice of the cake. Hopefully, we are as successful as taking it out as we were cutting it. Maybe you need a big plate because this yeah. is really tall. Okay. Don't look roughly. Thank you, Joyce. Mm -hmm. uh, now you will get the first piece here. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to continue on, Joyce. Wow. Ooh. That's what we're gonna do, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna share this cake, okay? Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna share the cake because you know, you know, we don't want to get greedy here, okay? Yeah. All right, so we're gonna kind of like cover it a little bit. Uh, tomorrow, you guys need to go and get one of those cake things that they put the cake in, and it lasts mm -hmm. forever. Okay, I'm gonna use the dish rag because I'm tacky. I'm mm -hmm. gonna wipe away a little bit of the frosting. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it smells like fish grease. <laughs> I that make you Damn. break out. Well, because I'm a nigger and I'm okay. from the hood, and these are the things we do when they're, you know, in desperate times. Okay, so I'm kind of used to that. You guys are not, and uh, it's okay. You know, it's okay. 
good. So here we go. All right, now we just need a fork. Three forks, which we're all going to kind of eat from the same plate here. Mm -hmm. Follow me, the father of the day. Okay. <sighs> So when we ate the cake, the cake was spoiled, and we were all like, oh my god, this is like so not good anymore. Like, it was very, very hysterical. We actually recorded it. We didn't know the cake was spoiled, but we just thought that it would still be fresh because we kept it refrigerated. And I have to say that that was one of my last and happiest moments with him because He's just so humble and the small things make him happy. He's Capricorn. It doesn't take much to, you know, make him happy. And just to see him so ecstatic and smiling over a spoiled cake. Because if somebody gave me a spoiled cake, look, we're going to be fighting because no. <laughs> but that would definitely have to be one of my funniest and latest memories with Rob. The irony of Asriel's fondest memory is that of R. Kelly celebrating Father's Day, a day of respecting a man's leadership for not only his family, but also for himself. A time where men are celebrated and remembered for the sometimes lessons they've learned and are now able to teach, especially for their daughters. These lessons stand as guidelines and comfort zones for some, especially when it comes to a young lady picking her life's partner for what should go on to be happily ever after, after I do. And the danger of an absent father is, or can be, picking a man who is not the right man, making him, I won't. If a female don't have a relationship with their father, she's gonna go out and look for a father when it comes to a man in a relationship. I am one of them. I, I do look for a guy like okay guys this is another one part of a setup this girl here part yeah, of a this setup damn grasshopper frog looking never mind let me shut up don't call people name now stop but it's part of the setup I said, let me stop <laughs> You just misbehave. Okay, guys, I'm going back. You guys are taking notes, right? Remember what um Shabazz put out there on IG? You see the uh the yeah. Make sure y'all take notes on this part it's too. The same time frame. Yeah, take notes, guys. Please. This girl gave five interviews. All right. All right, here we go. Empty spot because I didn't have my father around like that. Empty I mean, spot because when I was a baby, I didn't have my he was around, around but like that. when I got I mean, older, when I was a baby, he was around. Around. I didn't see him as much. So you need um, a father figure out here to show you how to be treated when it comes to being a female. Like, you don't need to be treated all kinds of ways. I see that's a, a lot going on right now with this whole situation. Jasmine, a young single mother hailing from South Carolina is what some would consider a devout fan of Robert Kelly. And like any other fan, Kelly would unwittingly use his God-given charm to lure her in, as he did with most. The thing with Kelly was he didn't discriminate and his appeal was open to all. It's as if he would see a common everyday girl simply as human. How I met R. Kelly. We were standing in front of the Trump Towers, May the 7th. I wanted three things from him. I wanted a picture, a hug, and an autograph. I did not get the autograph. <laughs> Everybody got to take a picture with him, and I was like the last person to take a picture with him. When he first met me, he said he loved my looks. Then the next thing he said, you just got a, a nice vibe. I guess that's what really made me want to hang out with him is because he actually said something about my lips and like, usually I get picked on about my lips. He took the picture and he asked everybody, do we want to go hang out with him that night? He was like, yeah, of course. So we all went to the basketball court, watched him play. We didn't leave until like four o'clock that morning. Finally, we got outside. He slid me his phone. 
that's when we just started texting and stuff. I texted him first. I was like, I really enjoyed you. And then he texted me back real quick. And he was like, I did too. The next thing was sport. Got to see him. And after we left, we all got in the spring with him. And we went straight to Starbucks. <laughs> the next day, I think he had the child support court hearing. Finally, I texted him and was like, yo, I just went to see you or whatever before I go. So he was like, all right, I'm at the basketball court. I get there and some guy came up to me and yelling at me and saying I was trying to set this man up. And he was like, I'll give you $100 now for you to leave. And I'm just sitting there like, what? I just want to say goodbye. He's like, no, you can't do that. So I'm in the car. And the next thing you know, he gets in the car with me. We're talking and he was like, my lawyers are telling me to stay away from me. Somebody went in his ear and told him that I was 16. And I'm like, I'm definitely nowhere near 16. I just turned 28. See, when, when he came at me like that, I was just sitting there like, oh, wait, what happened when we first met each other? That was that. Moved on. I ended up leaving Chicago and going to Washington, D.C. And he FaceTimed me like 4 o'clock in the morning. He was like, where are you? And I'm like, um, I'm, at Wa I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. He's like, well, hit me up when you get to Chicago. I'm like, oh, so you want me to come back to Chicago? So I'm like, okay, cool. I end up going back to Chicago, and I got to see him more. But it was kind of like a secret type of thing. Like, nobody pulls an arm in Chicago. I literally had to blow his phone up just to like see him like but yeah I also got to keep in mind he is a celebrity so I'm like I'm sure he's like busy finally he's like come slide through we gotta meet me at Dunkin Donuts right across the street from Trump Tower so I would have to go to the Dunkin Donuts and then go across the street and everything like that I actually got to go inside the Trump Towers quite a few times the first thing I seen was the awards. So I guess reality was finally here and like this is really true. We were sitting on the couch talking. I asked him the weirdest thing. I was like, can I just have a PCR? Cause I don't know what's really going on. Like, how do you feel or whatever? And he put his head down. I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, I don't know if I'm coming or going. And I was like, oh wow. I feel really bad. Like, I don't know if there's, there's nothing I can do. Like, I mean, I want to help, but. I just looked at him like another person. I'm like, you eat and sleep and do whatever I do. You just got more money and I don't even want you for your money. He started kissing me and stuff and just guess the oral sex came in. I said daddy. He didn't tell me to say daddy. I said it first and I guess that like really like turned him on because then he was like, I don't want you to do it no more. Give me a kiss. So we just started kissing the whole entire time and kissed the whole entire night. I'm like, I want my lips back now. <laughs> they don't get to have them back. In my head, I was like, this, this is crazy. Like, really? I'm, this is R. Kelly. I'm really this close to him now? Like, really? How did all uh, come from just wanting a picture and an autograph to this? A couple of times within a sprinter. Yeah, quite a few times. I thought it was fun because it's like, this is my summer vacation, so I just thought it was fun and I ain't really had nothing else to do. You know, he would just keep asking me these questions. Am I wired up over and over every time he see me? I'm like, no, I'm not trying to do anything. It just was so many people in his ear when it came to me. A lot of people were just asking him for his money. And I was like, I don't want him to ever think that. And he asked me, he was like, you sure you're not asking me for my money? And I'm like, I am positive. I don't want you for your money. I don't think... Everything is true on what they're saying because he could have just treated me bad off the bat like that. And he didn't. Like, he was real nice. I had this, like, deep, deep feeling thinking maybe, you know, he, he doesn't trust me that much. It's like you got to gain my trust at the end of the day. So I was kind of like, I was game. I was with it. You know, I don't mind. I guess that's because I'm, like, one of the nicest person you're going to ever meet. He seemed happy when, when I was around. Now, that's my opinion. Looking back at it, I kind of wish I would have done a lot of things different. I didn't meet him at a concert. 
and that probably would have been better instead of in front of the Trump Towers during the worst time right now. So I think if I would have met him when he was out singing concert, then yeah, it'd be different. Yeah, I would do it over again, though. Jasmine isn't the only one to do it over again. Since 2008, there have been many do-overs with what some would speculate to be hundreds of women. Unfortunately, in entertainment, women are a perk for some, easily conquered and often discarded, willingly. Perhaps those are the reasons many still defend the norm of an R&B singer. The question that should arise is, is it illegal? or is it immoral? That question encourages a healthy debate for almost all walks of life. However, one thing we know entertainment brings is often a whole lot of promise with a little bit of hope. I feel like I'm looking for hope. It's very hard. I've spent my last years with this man, so it's not something that I can just turn on and off. It's devastating. I feel like I'm a very intelligent, smart, bright 21 year old. I am definitely young, but I'm very mature in spirit. And I just feel like, you know, anyone who thinks that I'm brainwashed and not, you know, smart enough to make my own decisions, I just feel like that determines how, you know, their mentality. That's not something I can control, but I know that I'm very smart and I know that I'm intelligent. If he were to get convicted, I, of course, would be heartbroken. I would definitely, you know, have to continue living my life and doing what makes me happy. Um, I know Rob, I last conversation that I had with him in Chicago, you know, he inspired me and told me, Bear, just, do what you want to do what makes you happy. He told me to continue to pursue my dreams, pursue whatever I want to pursue. And that's really all that I would be able to do. It feels like a high. I mean, it feels like, you know, you're in love, you're happy to be in love, and you feel like no matter what you go through with this person, it's worth going through because there's no other person you would want to go through this with. And that's with, you know, you being in love with whoever it is, you know, not just me and Rob personally, but that could be any other person's relationship. You just feel like no matter what, the good or the bad, you want to go through it with that person. I feel like truthfully, all of the women that have been associated with Robert, I feel like this is me personally. Once they saw him, they saw him as a celebrity, not as a human being. They did not meet him at church. They didn't know him, know which way, except for as R. Kelly, whether they saw him at a mall, whether they saw him at a movie theater, whether they saw him as a, at a park, whether they saw him at a show. And so <clears throat> no matter what, all of them met him as a celebrity. And they were infatuated with that celebrity. And because of that, I feel like a lot of them just dated him because of that, because of who he was, because of the life that he had, because of the life that he could provide them. You know, a lot of them talk about how badly they were tortured, but can you talk about the shopping spree? Can you talk about you keeping your hair and nails done? Can you talk about all the great times that you had dinner and was spending money and was splurging and was so happy? Because one thing about Robert, he has a very giving heart. And there is no way at all whatsoever that he is a celebrity and he's not giving them a penny to enjoy themselves. And that's where I get so upset because as a celebrity, he has no reason to keep you kidnapped or keep you tied up. He just has no reason to do that when he can allow you to move freely, take care of you, and still, you know, at the end of the day, <clears throat> whatever will happen will happen, you know. So for people to just say that, you know, oh, I was just kidnapped or I 
I was tied up, if I couldn't do this. It's like, what about the good times? I know there were good times. The good times are the times people forget very easily. Contrary to all the accusations against R. Kelly, what's easier believed is the horror trails left to be recited and remembered. But who tells these tales, tangled in weed? Stories of caution, hard to believe. Stories told and sold with judgment of public jurors presuming guilt to unfold. There is a common denominator for most of R. Kelly's accusers, the poverty line. It is a sad and unfortunate truth known to a part of America who can identify. These people are common everyday people who have either struggled themselves or know someone who has. Although these people come from less than mainstream America, they take pride within struggle. They live a truth most would dare call lies. Perhaps this is why there are so many who disbelieve Kelly's current accusers and sometimes seem obsessed in his defense. It is that demographic who see long hallways in dark despair, dope fiends and drug addicts preying upon themselves because the prayers some would have you believe stand on almost every corner, just as the liquor stores do, offering choices to inebriate or alleviate problems the weak could hardly face. It is these people who can see what others can't because oftentimes they've seen the worst and can identify game, the kind of game that has no contracts. And sometimes you make up the rules needed to win with rules to escape poverty, crime, drugs, or a better way of life. The hard unbiased truth is some will try and achieve any status by any means necessary. And while others see it as necessary, there are some who see different. They see honor, truth, and dignity. And although their conditions could be different, they can see and read truth, their truth. And the truth of the matter is when you come from these conditions, everybody's truth is different. Kelly had a friendship with my family, most importantly, my mother. We had a family friend that was R. Kelly's barber and a friend that was his backup singer, which it was the barber's wife. My cousin, she they put everything in motion. They didn't even tell my mom. My mom just thought she was going somewhere to listen to music. And so she was in the studio and, you know, they were asking her, what would she like to drink? And she had some beer. She said, Corona beers. And so next thing you know, our Kelly comes out and he says, happy birthday. And they talk and he takes her around the studio. You know, he just was treating her nice, hugging her, holding her. And he called her mom from that point on. And that was her son. She was just telling him how much she loves his music. And she's, you know, an older lady, but she's been following him. So from that point, 
she started going to watch him play basketball. And, and he always acknowledged her as mom when she went to his basketball games. He was, you know, searching for a family. I think he really wanted a family with him coming from such a dysfunctional family. But he, I don't think he would have realized that every family has problems. You know, I think he was looking for a perfect family. Well, my mom ended up with lung cancer. And so they got in touch with our Kelly. And our Kelly called my mom. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. You know I've been sick. Yeah, I, I, just, I just told you. You just found it out? That's all. Oh, really? Well, how am my son doing? I'm doing good. What songs you want to hear? You want me to, want me to say something, sound nature real quick? What you want to hear? Heaven choose you to be my valentine. That's I my... Told you. Be my valentine. I believe I can fly. Okay, uh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I believe I can fly. Yes. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night, night and day. day. When my oh, wings fly away. I believe I can fly. Hey, that sounds so good. That sounds so good. Are you going to, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sick. I got cancer. I know, I know. Yeah. So I've been. I got you though. Yeah, yeah, you got um, you got me wrapped around your arms. Absolutely. Yeah. So you good? good. I'm good. I hope it stay good. Oh no, you gonna stay good? Oh, always. Always. Yeah. And I know that is yes, somebody. <laughs> Hey, now. And I know somebody's gonna take up the I know one thing for sure. I'm gonna put on my Yeah. I'm going to Yeah. I'm gonna step. Get on out of here. You know what? I Robert, next two weeks will be my birthday. Wow. Yeah. Happy birthday. And I hope I can get around. But right now, I can't do nothing. But just sit around and listen to my song. That's right. Yeah, share my love. <laughs> Say that. Share my love. Okay, here we go. I just want to share my love. Yes. I just want to share my, my love. love. Oh. Yes. I just want to share my love. Share my love. Share my I love. love you. You. I'm all hey, I hear you. I'm my love. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. You getting on out right there. You getting on out right there. Well, listen, you keep in contact with me and keep praying for me because it's kind of rough right now. I'm going. I am. I'm already praying. I got you. Okay. Yeah, I got you. Got a Oh, okay. All right. Okay, then. Call it on and check up on you. Okay. All right. Mama, love you, baby. All right. Okay. Okay.
Bye bye. Bye. Unfortunately, my mom died a couple of days after that. And we was gonna try to get him to come to the funeral, but he was on tour and he would have sang for my mother. That makes me feel good. It makes me feel good that my mom was so happy. That was a memory that she had as she was dying, that he sang to her. Yeah, and I, I had a, a new respect for him from that point. R. Kelly was not the monster that we know him and what people are portraying him to be. I am pro R. Kelly. I will just wait for the evidence for the trial. It really doesn't matter because I'm going to stick behind him regardless. Next, on part four. No, this is one on one. This is like. Okay. Open this up. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Hey! <laughs> Yes, yes. He has a video of me. Um, he made me do this video actually of me doing a number two in a cup and then eating it out of the cup. It's done. It's over. It's over. You may not even make it to try. I'm so sorry for you. I'm sorry. I really did love you. And you, you lied to me and you used me and you played me. Precedence. 